Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy New Year, too, to the Athens International Church and Filipino Center Churches. I'm so grateful to be with you this Sabbath day, the first Sabbath of the year. And I was privileged that uh, Pastor Perkins invited me to speak before you the first Sabbath of the year. And you know, most of us have no sleep because we watch the events at 12 o'clock. And I'm so grateful that Pastor Fernandez have given me this particular topic, how to face the uncertainty. Because everything is uncertain. But I want to bring greetings from the Philippines to our brothers and sisters who are from Filipino churches and all other international brethren living in Athens and celebrating God's goodness and mercy this year. And so, it is so important for me that I could share with you the messages for this year. Let me go directly. Go back to Athens in history. Ancient Athens is the world philosopher's capital. It is the home of famous thinkers. In Paul's time, Athens, Greece is the center of the greatest philosophers and thinkers that shape and influence the different nations' worldviews about life, religion, ethics, medicine, education, and other, and is still alive today. Among more than 20 famous thinkers and philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, among others, were really shaping the world until today. However, did you know that there is a famous, at that particular time, there is a line spoken by one of the church father, Tertullian, the famous line was, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? I you know I study philosophy a lot, and this thing, go back at that particular time because Athens is the home of philosophers, whereas Jerusalem, where God's people, is the home of faith and religion. And if you try, because we are going to revisit as Athens, you know that there was an international church where the Jews, Gentiles, Greek philosophers, Stoics, and Epicureans. The Greek culture at the time was characterized by extensive, exciting learning and listening to new things. Any new things would be presented to the public, such as Aeropagos or Mars Hill, that people may witness and evaluate the subject under discussion. Athens at the time, people were open-minded because they were thinkers. They would intensively discuss and debate how many legs the spider has, rather than to see the actual spider. So they debate how many teeth has a horse, rather than go to the horse and observe and count. These are the home of the thinkers. They would rather think because they are deep thinkers. And I hope that in the 21st century, Adventist Christians should be thinkers and evaluate what we have think and what we have here. And so, there in others, we find the finest secular and humanistic philosophy. However, they are so deep thinkers, but they are so short of thinking of a true God. People were so religious, yet very ignorant, according to Acts 17, verses 22 and 23. And Paul delivered the unsurpassed and equal and the finest biblical philosophy from protology to eschatology. The creator, God and his creation, true worship, 
limits of people and nation, probationary time, opportunity to find and know God, his nature, his character, to repent and prepare for the coming judgment and resurrection. As a result, renowned and influential people were converted to Christianity like Dionysius and the Maris and many others according to Acts 17, 22 to 24. That's our revisiting. Let's look at today the topic. The uncertainty of life because I am tasked to deliver a message how to face the uncertainty. Life on earth is indeed uncertain as the word of God affirms. James writes, what is your life? It is even like a before or a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. That's what James says about life. In fact, prophet Isaiah paints it. All flesh is grass. Its loveliness is like flower in the field. The grass withers and the flowers fade. Isaiah 40 verses 6 and 7. So James in a graphic portrayal says, Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Clear. We do not know. Uncertain in life. So life is a transient, temporal, delicate, fragile. Take good care of it. For it is uncertain. This is the truth. So the wise man on earth, Solomon declares, I know there is nothing better for them than to rejoice, to do good in their lives, and that very man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. This is the gift of God. In fact, this expression is repeated in the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 5 and others. Meaning to say, there is nothing better. This is God-centered philosophy of life that every Adventist Christian should understand. Rejoice, not happy. Because happiness is temporal. But rejoicing, there is a spirit of God that prompts rejoicing regardless of situation. Second is that do good in their lives. What are you doing with your lives, my brothers and sisters? And also, we need to eat and drink. To enjoy the good of his labor because everything is a gift from God. So, my question, did you maximize the gift of God to its fullness while living in uncertainty and temporal life? Our months, our year, our time, our days, months, and years are already determined according to the word of God. Job 14.5 says, Since the days are determined, the number of the months is with you. You have appointed limits so that he cannot pass. Meaning to say, God already determined when to exist and when to cease to exist. Our months, years on this earth is determined we cannot pass. We have to understand that. So, what about our lifestyle? Because God already told us that he has given us abundant life. But our lifestyle is a problem. So I'm asking about our lifestyle in eating, drinking, working, thinking. This greatly affects the lifespan that God has so determined to give to his people. And besides that, there are many factors of a lifespan. Living on planet Earth. Our environment, our culture, mysterious illness, genetics and epigenetics contribute something to the quantity and the quality of life we live. This alter the determined abundant life that God has given for us because Jesus says, I give them abundant life. But there are so many other factors that make life uncertain. King Solomon says, why you should die before your time? 
Let's go back to the philosophy. Do good to your life. Our eating, drinking, thinking, working, when we understand it's a gift of God, we should take good care and be responsible. Besides, the unprecedented events like accident, as Solomon says, you know, there is no accident in the Bible, but look at this verse. I look at the principle. For man also does not know his time. Like a fish caught in a cruel net. Like birds caught in a snare. So the son of man are snared an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Ecclesiastes 7.12. It means to say, my brothers and sisters, there are unprecedented events that we need to expect. If we look at this principle, we fall like in a cruel net or a, a bird or a fish. Remember what Ecclesiastes is saying. Remember your creator before the silver cord is lost. Our life is compared to a silver cord. That's life. Silver is a means of blessing. Or a golden bowl is broken. A pitcher shattered at the fountain, or wheel at the broken, broken at the wheel. Ecclesiastes 12 says, meaning to say, if you try to look at how God gives us a life, silver, golden, pitcher, well, it means to say the usefulness and blessing to ourselves and blessing to others. But they are uncertain because the silver cord is lost. The golden ball is broken. A pitcher is shattered. And a well that makes things easy to carry, broken. Meaning to say, we need to be careful because our life is really uncertain. First, let us face first the God of certainty before facing the uncertainty. God is so certain, it's of us. Sure, the psalmist says, Lord, you have searched me. You have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. No word in my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have heads behind me and before. You laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attend. Let me explain. If God already searched us because he is a certain God, the God of certainty searched me, have known me, everything what I have done, even my insecurity in the future, in my family, in my finances, and everything. This is the secret, my brothers and sisters. In living in a certain, facing uncertainty. Since God is so certain about us, He knows our ways. He knows your thinking. Let's come to this God. It is an assurance. So, this is the solid basis where we stand in the stream of time in facing all the threats of uncertainty of life. There are so many Christians that have no certain assurance of salvation. This attitude is manifested in facing uncertainty of life. They are easily shaken, alarmed, insecure when things and experience seems life seems to be difficult and dark. There is a problem. Paul admonishes us, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. 2 Thessalonians 5, 18. It means to say, my brothers and sisters, regardless of what happened in the future, the events that taking place around us and around the world that we cannot explain, we need to give thanks because the uncertainty of everything. Once we anchor our faith in God, the God of certainty, then we are secure. Besides that, 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. Philippians 4, 6. It is a high time for us, my brothers and sisters, to bring everything to the Lord in prayer. Supplication. Let God. Oh Lord, I'm uncertain of what is happening around the world. But I'm so thankful that you are our God. And so, here is Christian borrowing unfounded temporal worry with the unrealistic or realistic in the future and uncertainty of life is an utter blunt distrust to God as the creator of everything. In his enabling power as God who is a provider, guide, protector, keeper, sustainer whom Jesus loved and gave his life. I said, when we have such thing, it's a blunt distrust. Because we have not placed our faith and trust in the creator and the provider and the sustainer of this world. In fact, to tell you frankly, worry destroys. It kills. It paralyzes everything. That's why six times Jesus used that in Matthew. He declared that most, if not all people, are worried of temporal things, not eternal or lasting. People are earthly-centered minded, crisis-centered, rather than God and Christ-centered minded people. That's the reality. Earthly-centered minds destroys, kills, paralyzes our faith, our hope in this temporal life if it is not handled properly. But Jesus assures us, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Facing uncertainty, Jesus says, do not worry about your life. Matthew 6.25, in this assurance and surety, is this assurance cannot be cast in the bank of heaven? Sure, you can cast it in the bank of heaven if you have deposited something. Because what we deposit is what we withdraw. That's according to Jesus in Luke 6.45. In facing uncertainty of life suggests that we make certain that we have a deposit something beyond this transient life. So there is a bank of heaven. As Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6, 33, that has such been long promise, but yet we ignore. Meaning to say, banking in his kingdom is a must. Ellen White, lamentable note, she said, but many shows their works that they dare not trust the bank of heaven. Christian service, 151. Is that you? God invites us, as he was directed, and based in the bank of heaven. I bet it's home 397. So meaning to say, we feel so uncertain because we don't have a backup. We cannot face head on and stand on a solid ground the uncertainty of life when we don't have heaven's backup. Yet it is not yet too late. To place what God has given to us to be deposited in his bank. Remember Noah. Ellen White says in Pachak and Prophets, page 95. All that he possessed, he invested in the ark. Just imagine, by believing in his word, Noah never seen a droplet of rain. He does not know about typhoon or flood or rain because there was no rain from creation at that time. But you know, today people say, okay, let us keep something for the rainy days. So that's what happened to the people in the world outside Noah's territory. All other keeps rainy days. The flood, get and swept them all in the basement. Noah in his investment, still he possesses since he placed it in God's hand or God's bank. What about you? 
worry, distraction. Many of us, like the two sisters, whom Jesus was so close, Mary and Martha. And I called it Martha Theology of Life. Martha was distracted with much serving. She approached Jesus and said to him, Lord, do you care of my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. Luke 10, verses 40 and 42. It's a very wonderful thing. We are so worried with many things, so troubled with many things. But Jesus says there is only one thing needed, and we need Martha theology. Meaning to say, let us choose something that will not be taken from us. In time of crisis, in the time where things are too difficult to understand and to explain. And so Jesus is, Ellen White is saying, the world has too much in our thoughts. The kingdom of heaven too little. Evaluate that in your life today, my brothers and sisters. How many hours you spend with Jesus? How many hours you spend reading his word and find guidance and everything and assurance in our time, in particular time of this world today? We are too busy, distracted, less time with God and personal preparation for Jesus coming is neglected. Mary invests in the bank of heaven and Martha on a good bank, but not lasting to eternity. It is a picture to most of us today. So busy with many good things, but not lasting. Our minds have so much attracted, distracted of these things of this world, and the kingdom of God has a little space in our mind. Surety in a time of uncertainty. Paul's strong admonition. Be transformed by renewing your mind. That you may prove what is good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Are we transformed? Are we renewing our mind? When things is so uncertain, we are so grateful because Jesus is coming. And Paul says, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. Colossians 3, verse 2. And that's the problem. That's why we are, many of us, are uncertain about our future. Why? So much. Our mind is really in this world. But Paul says, set your minds above. Not on earth. Because when you set your mind above, this is what Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. We cannot really exist with two kinds of mind. One mind must be superior over the earthly mind. This is fundamental spiritual criteria in banking in heaven. When our mind is not a Christian mind, we cannot have the mind of Christ. Only when we have Christ's mind, then the Holy Spirit will guide us into all the truth for our surety. For this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be guided even to death. This is a beautiful. If we trust God, everything from the time we were born until the day we die, our God is our guide. Surety. So, let's invest our means in heaven. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age not to become haughty. Nor trust uncertain riches, but on the living God who gives richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up themselves. A good foundation in time to come that they may hold on to eternal life. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. That is banking in heaven. 
Not on earth. Not on earth. Many times God complains saying, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living potters, and hewn themselves cistern, broken cistern that cannot hold no water. Jeremiah 2.13 In effect, Jesus said, Take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Luke 11.35 on Matthew, he said, If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Most of our thinking, this is the light, this is correct. Evaluate that with the standard of the eternal guide, and that is the Bible. You're thinking this is light? But Jesus is so possible that our thinking, our evaluation is correct. But when we put it in the standard of the guide to heaven, our thinking is darkness. That's why we are uncertain about the future. So, I'm asking, is your banking in heaven already been done? Or we choose which bank, temporal or eternal investment? Because Jesus said it, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we think so much of the world, not in his kingdom, how to finish his kingdom, how to be involved in his kingdom, part of his kingdom, our investment will not last. Worry of the world goods, but not with God's kingdom. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 6, where he asks, which of you worry can add cubit in your stature? Worrying is really, but this is the number one problem. Worry. Worry about clothing, Jesus says. Worry about what to eat, what to drink. Worry about the future. For the second time, Jesus says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Verse 34. Why? For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Sounds like what we have looked at in some. God knows my down sitting, my thinking, and everything. Worry is a dangerous for a Christian. Reason, worry undermines God that he cannot be trusted. Second, worry question is sovereignty. Meaning to say he cannot fulfill worry, question the sincerity of God, and it erodes our faith. I'm giving you here, I was in Jerusalem. You know, with my friends, three of us, one from Puerto Rico, one from Athens, and two of us Filipino, we bought our ticket and we want to look at Hezekiah Daniel. I did not understand that my friend, so we were there on the entrance of Hezekiah Tunnel. It is a millennium of years. And so I started there, in, I started in Gihon Spring. And it is uh, 533 meters, about 25 to 30 minutes, and the water is knee high. So I thought they were following me. So I went in, and there is, the tunnel was so dark. And I have only my cell phone. So I own the light of my cell phone and carry my little things, my, my passport and my wallet because the water is above the knee. And you know, I did not know that I was alone. And I was a close to Pubia person. And I know that my pressure is becoming high. And they said, Lord, I don't know what happened because I keep shouting to my friend. No one responded. And so I walk and I said, Lord, if I'm going to die, I just allow the flow of the water to bring my body to the end of this tunnel. And I was strengthened. And I was so glad that I was not lost because this tunnel has some ways by which you will be misled. 
And about 20 minutes of walking, I hear the sound. And so I walk past. You know, when someone is encouraging, you are alone already, you are in the grave, you are already in the tomb. And so what happened? So when I hear that, it, and later on, I hear their voices, and I saw lights, and I was so delighted. I said, thank you, Lord. And then I keep distance from them because I know they were Spanish people. And then I came out in the pool of Siloam. So I sat there and meditating, what happened to my friend? Later on, my friend came. I said, where are our friends? Said, oh, they back out. So only two of us. You know, in that instant, I already have given my life to God. Because I know who he is. I was not so afraid. So I just commit myself in a certain, but God was so wonderful. This, if you have time, you go to Jerusalem and go to uh, the city of David and you can find. Because actually the problem is the crisis of faith. That's why Jesus, looking in the end of time, he said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Why? Because most of us do not trust God and his word. I'm sorry to tell you that. We would trust our technology, our mind, our thinking, our resources, which is temporal rather than the lasting. During the first advent of Jesus Christ, there was a crisis of faith. In his people, Israel, Jesus repeatedly had this expression, you of little faith, lack of faith, little faith. To his disciples who were terrified by the waves, he declared, why are you fearful? You little faith. Peter attempted to walk in the water and Jesus reached out his hand and he said, oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? Oh, little faith. So incredible that the faith was in crisis in the time of Jesus Christ. What factors that destroy or erode their faith? They think so much about the world. In the first advent, God's people were destitute of faith. So, Jesus said, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Where is your faith? This is a repeated question of Jesus Christ, which is also the same questions he wants to address to us. So Jesus' question was valid and legitimate for the second advent was a microcosm. The first advent was a microcosm of the first advent. And you know, the Roman Christians were famous for the great faith. Your faith is being reported throughout the whole world. God's people... Lack of faith, no faith. And that faith was obeying faith, Romans 16, 26. Meaning to say, in their Christian life from beginning, middle to the end, life of faith was evident. And it could happen today. The faith of the Gentile were astounding compared to the people of God, Israel. The Roman centurion says concerning his faith, Jesus said, I say to you, I have not found such great faith not even in Israel. To a Canaanite woman, a woman said, woman, great is your faith. Why is it that people outside the people of God have great faith and the people of God have no faith? It tells us the mirror what happened in our age today. What shall we do? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness by faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. Romans 9, 30 and 32. So let us find characteristics of a quality faith that is Christological that would be our bank in heaven in facing crisis in facing uncertainty of this year and the years to come. Because Paul says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. First, what kind of faith? Faith that overcomes the world. 
This is found in John 5, 4. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory has all become the world, even our faith. Question, is your faith able to overcome the world? Or you are overcome by the world because you don't have faith. Second, faith is pressure. Precious. Should be treasured by believers. Those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God, the Savior of Jesus Christ. How precious is your faith? Unless it is genuine, it is not precious. It is fancy. Therefore, no value, it is not a gem. Third, genuine faith. The genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, be bound to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of the Lord. Genuine. Many of us today have faith. Easily shaken faith. Immediately question about God. Third, is your faith holy? Because Jude 20 says, building up yourself in the most holy faith. Is our faith holy? And that our faith sanctify us through the ministration of the Holy Spirit and his holy angels. Number four, justifying faith is a faith that is opposed to condemnation. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Five, faith that works through love. But faith working through love in Galatians 5, 6 is what we need today. Saving faith. We are saved through faith. It's not our work. Saving faith is a living faith. And the last, faith certified by works. Faith perfected by works. That's what Jim is saying. So, facing uncertainty is a matter of quality of faith. So, Ecclesiastes is telling us, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. Just like Job, when adversity was incredible, his wife was really affected. And tell Job, Job, curse your God. But Job, with the quality of faith, he said, Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? Both are blessing and each has its own purpose and function where it happens. Remember Psalm 139. How precious is your thoughts on me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more than a number of the sun. That's how God take good care of us, my brothers and sisters. We have nothing to worry about the future. So it's... He says, Nehemiah, do not worry. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The Lord is my strength, my song. He's become my salvation. That's the psalm he says in Psalm 118, 118 verse 14. Fear not, I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteousness. What a certain promises. The name of the Lord is our strong tower. The righteous will run to it and say, My brothers and sisters in Athens, in this year 21, surety should be anchored. You know, I love this chapter because I memorized these chapters. Listen, he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence my comes help. 
My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. Who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he keeps Israel, shall never slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He preserved your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. The Psalm 121, beautiful. The Lord is our keeper. The Lord is the one, our helper, who created the heavens and the earth. He shall keep us. He will not sleep or slumber. In fact, he says, the Lord is the keeper of your soul. Preserve you from evil. He preserved us in our going out the year 2020 and the coming 2021. This is a promise. Let me read a portion from Ellen White. Open Christian life is beset by dangers. Duty seems hard to perform. Imagination picture impending ruin before and bondage or death behind. Yet the voice of God speak clearly. Go forward. We should obey this command even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness. The obstacle that hinder our progress will never disappear. But those who deeper obedience till every shadow of uncertainty disappear, there remains no rest of failure or defeat. We'll never obey at all. But faith courageously urged to advance. Hope all things, believe all things. The path where God leads the way may lie through a desert or a sea, but it is a safe path. Patrick and Prophets 2.90 the people of the Old Testament followed the counsel and dictates of their evil hearts. And they went backward, not forward. Jeremiah 7, 7 verse 24. My brothers and sisters in Athens, let us go forward by faith. Let us not trust our feeling. Jesus has that on Calvary. On Calvary, he says, Father, let it be, but not my will. And in, in fact, he cannot see the future. But he did not trust his feeling. Because feeling is dangerous. He trusts by faith who has promised him. And the same faith that is communicated and given to us as we look in these years. My brothers and sisters in Athens, in the year 2021, Go forward in faith. Because in faith, nothing is impossible. Because that is the basis, the only basis by which our acceptance with God of his promises, how we face the uncertainty, because he is a God of certainty. And I would like to thank you and pray that all these 12 men of 2021, shalom to all of you. The fullness of God's blessing be with you. Shalom to all and happy new year. This is my prayer.